for Markets with May. And today we're going to go through Bank of the Ozarks. And this is part of my series of just going through bank financials. Some people are interested because they are on the stock market side. Some people are interested because these are their actual bank or they're trying to figure out what to do next or what questions to even ask or to investigate how to think about it. So Bank of the Ozarks, I... I don't think I have like any residual position at this point on Bank of the Ozarks. Um, I think I did strangles. And, um, you know, I'm kind of mostly, I think, going to stay out of it because this bank does look a little bit different from the other banks, both in positive, mostly in the positive, I would say, to the bank's credit. But I do want to go through it because I think as you get to see more banks, it really highlights why one bank over the other might be at risk versus not at risk. And, um, you know, I have to give a little shout out because just like everybody else, I obviously love the Ozarks, the not, I mean, for vacation, yeah, it's gorgeous, but I mean, obviously the show, one of my favorite characters, I don't know if you want to put your favorite character from the Ozarks in the comments, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, my favorite character on the Ozarks is this character. I don't know. I just respect her a lot. Um, okay. Okay. Let's get into the financials of it. But if I were to sum it up, I do actually think it looks slightly better than some of the other uh, banks that I've been doing these reviews on. But their dynamic is a little bit different and it highlights the uniqueness of this particular um, banking situation that we have. Okay. One second. Let me actually move this. So I want to review this yet again. Burry Tracker, got to give them props. This is the thing that he put out um, this, you could follow them on Twitter if you wish. Um, but, um, they, he put out this chart and then I've subsequently added some titles since I literally say it every show deposits, you know, on the left greater than 250 is rich people and rich businesses, businesses that are thriving and have 250,000 in cash. And then unrealized loss percentage of CET capital, that's your mark to market risk. That's your duration risk. That's how you would, largely speaking, look at, at that. Now, some people would be like, well, no, May, there could be other types of losses. And that is true, except again, these are paper losses and most of it, most of it, like not even, I don't know that I'd be shocked if anyone actually felt very strongly against me on this, but the largest component of this is going to be that 450 uh, basis points that we increased last year, therefore creating a paper loss for every single bank. So if you look at this chart, um, I think the reason people were concerned is because even though the unrealized losses are low, it does have rich, cut. it has rich customers. Okay. I mean, it's based in Little Rock, Arkansas. A lot of folks don't know that believe that the South is not wealthy. That's completely wrong. Do you know what I mean? And so, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and so, so that's where it comes into play a bit. There are also some people that care on the real estate side of the portfolio. I personally don't necessarily think that the real estate is what is doing them in at this point or doing any of this market and doing any of the banks in. Um, if anything, I see kind of the opposite. Now, hold on. I did not switch over and give you guys um, the lowdown on this. But if um, if we just go through the, the rough top line numbers, OK, um, I'll read them to you. We've got this this stock currently trading at about just under one times book value. OK, um, and, and there's a good reason for that revenue on the quarter, which was reported on April 20th, but closed out the quarter March 30th timestamp end of March was up 26 percent. Earnings per share was up 39%, giving them a return on equity of 15% and a return on tangible equity of 17%, which puts them actually dead in the middle as far as statistics go, albeit much higher on revenue and earnings upside. They did have a fairly significant, or they, okay, so their annualized charge offs are 14 basis points, which makes them slightly below the average, but the actual quarter did see more charge offs. And that's the thing that I kind of really want to go through. And their CET capital came in at 10.9%. Now we're going to go through all of that. So you don't, for those of you that are more visual in nature, don't sweat it. We are going to go through every single piece of that. It's interesting to me though, because this quarter, the um, details on the banking is just, you're getting way more than, than typically you'd get 
on the breakout. So this is just the revenue breakout that they did this quarter. Um, this is my first time listening to calls. So I don't know if they do this every quarter, but across most of the financials, the revenue breakouts and where the, the money is coming from is even more detailed than, than I've seen in the past. But when we look at this again, you have the portion of revenue. I'm going to use these words so that people can map it back to the financials of any company, but the portion of revenue that comes from interest margin, that is the loans that you made versus the cost of capital versus how much you it cost you to make that loan in the beginning, your, your cost for that financing, right? And then you give what's called a spread over it. And that's, that's your revenue. And so after you net that out, you have net interest income. That was up a lot. Okay. So net interest income was up 26% to 45 divided by 309 year over year. Okay. And that's kind of a big deal because you can see that there's a huge uptick in their interest expense, which they got to pass through. And this one is something to watch for because everyone is so focused on banks going bust because of this, that, and the other. And the real, like, there's so many better conversations to have, not the least of which is if it's going to be more expensive for the banks, then it has to ultimately be more expensive for the consumer, the businesses, the individuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this we're seeing, they got ahead of the, they were enough, far enough ahead of the curve to push that right on through. Then there's fee-based income. Every bank has that as the second type of income. Some have it as a larger percentage of income. Some have it as a smaller percent. Here you can see that was um, it's a small percentage of income, 27 billion versus 309. And even last quarter, it was much higher. But you can see here, that was down a lot. And they didn't really speak to that because for whatever reason, I think the bank analysts are afraid of never being allowed to be on the call again. So they tend to like, they, this tended to be a very um, gracious call. Let me say it that way. Because if you look at it, both as a percentage of total revenue and also year year over year on the quarter, that was down a lot. And it's it's not down a lot, just down a lot. It's actually down a lot. And that's despite this one-time gain of $1.7 billion on investment securities. Now, what were those investment securities? Those investment securities, there's nothing weird on them. It was just regular agency and treasury securities, which was 97% of the total investment securities. But, and here's the weird thing, when you look through all of the statements, it almost looks like this is like, is an accounting exercise more than it's an actual gain. Okay. If it wasn't that everything else in this, in these financials was good, I would be irritated, but I'm not irritated with them because the other stuff on the financial statements look like they're fine. But I am slightly irritated. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> but, um, but, but that, that is the one thing as relates to the revenue line item, which for banks is a lot bigger, making it therefore, I think very confusing for the average person to go through this. That is the one thing that was weird as far as revenue goes. But once we go down to expenses, it's not as weird. Okay. So you still have that, that even if I was like, I don't know what this is. I don't want to give you credit for it. 1.7 billion, because I don't feel like you explained it. That still looks like a paper gain to me, but um, it may be that it's the interest in that and in, in some stuff termed out. But if I go to the expenses, that 2 billion is nothing compared to how well they did on the quarter with everything else. So I can't be irritated with them because 169 versus 132 is a strong number. You know, I mean, just so you know, banks don't usually have net income up 30%. Part of the reason that banks are able to do it now is because we've raised interest rates 450 basis points. So they're, com they're comparing against a quarter when the interest rates were really low. OK, so any bank that isn't having severe difficulty is showing these crazy net income numbers period. And that is something that I have said that I know the press ignores completely that essentially all of this increasing of interest rates is trading one type of earnings, which is current period earnings relative to last period earnings for the large, for the longer tail of just knocking everybody out as far as, as far as some of these banks go. Okay. So if that's not, uh, if that's super confusing, let me know. I do have other videos that tried to explain it in each one, but because Oz Ozark didn't have this massive deposit loss, which I'll show you in a second, it actually looks great for, for them for the most part. And I'll show you the only baby little tiny weakness. And I, and I look at this because, okay, so here is the balance sheet. Um, 
no, sorry. This is a summary sheet that they had uh, in there. And the one thing I want to show you is, and this is why I'm saying it looks like they're playing past the potato through the accounting statements. But again, the numbers aren't big enough where I think that they're in the wrong to do that is because net unrealized losses does show a 60, six, up 61 million, which is a pretty big uptick, right? And then you kind of have to chase the losses down across the balance sheet. Again, they made a ton of money. So it, it, it doesn't matter, quite frankly, but it is a little bit difficult to read when you go through this. So their issue is at this point, not losses, okay? The only little baby thing, um, if I go through the balance sheet, and I'll come back to operating expenses, um, but I don't want, like, the only little baby thing is that um, if you look at, um, on the balance sheet, it, it has to do with the composite of the liabilities, okay? I'm going to say this in a very particular way because actually relative to some of the other banks that I've discussed that I think are more problem children, this is not bad. And the reason it's not bad, okay, so the part that is a little bit got people not not super happy is because of of the to so 28 billion in assets, right? But 22 billion of that is funded through deposits. So unlike, you know, First Republic, who only had about half the, the assets funded by deposits at the time that it went kablam, for lack of a better way to describe it, this is like a far more deposit funded company. However, if we look at deposits, we see them up from December to March. So they did not have a deposit exodus. And I have said before, more than once, these banks aren't overvalued so much as it's just, can they keep the deposits in the bank or not? You know, they didn't really get pushed on this call as to why they didn't have problems with their deposits. But nonetheless, the numbers are what they are. People didn't leave the bank. Now, I think part of the reason they didn't leave the bank is because they're ex their specific mix of customer base, which is very heavily skewed towards, it looks to me like real estate, but not just real estate, land development. And, you know, love them for that because they were super Southern as relates to, as relates to, um, as relates to the way that they described their land development. I believe one of the quotes was something like, uh, let me see if I pulled it off. A phenomenal, sorry, this is in Capital One. I'm going to do Capital One a different time. This is one of the quotes this is on my notes. A phenomenal vertical development on that piece of dirt. Somebody was asking about one of their properties, and it was this piece of land that had yet to be developed that's in, the enter in an entertainment area of Los Angeles. And they're obviously talking about a high rise, but I love their phraseology because I, too, love to use creative phraseology. They're just talking about a really... Um, a fancy high rise that they're probably going to put up on this piece of dirt, whether that guy does it or somebody else does it, they believe it'll get done given the location. So um, the point is that they do actually have quite a lot of land-based property. Let me see if I can show that. Um, one second, let me stop sharing. Um, and this was where um, this is where I think that there are some that have concerns because you actually, if you, if you're negative on them because of this, you do have to have some strong views, which I do not have on real estate. And so for example, construction land development is 36% of the 22 billion of loans, 22 billion of loans, 28 billion total assets. So most of that assets is construction and land development. That's where people are a little bit freaked out. They obviously spent a lot of the call talking about the fact that they have very few projects over the course of the history of the bank that have not been profitable for the investors that are alongside or otherwise. And so and also they discussed extensively how the folks that do this type of thing are very different and, and, and the subsequent investor base associated with it is very, very different than like you know, just classic residential or multifamily residential or even office or other parts of, of, um, of real estate. You have to make a call on this as far as that goes. I have no skin in this game to make a call, but that's where I think some people have a little bit of a concern, let's call it, because it's such a large percentage and that's not normally the case for most banks. Let me say it that way, okay? If you look even at CMA, the mix of real estate that they have doesn't look like construction and land development, 40%. So that is the one thing on the balance sheet that I think upset a few people and have people like scratching their heads as to how do I feel about that? 
Um, other things that I would just mention that um, are so on the pot, some of them are positive, some of them are negative, ne negative, but let me just go through them. This was the deposit mix and it really didn't change very much. Okay. So one of the things I'm now absolutely checking for is, is it more expensive for you, your cost of capital? And given that they actually ended up having a slight increase from the previous year on the number of deposits, this is actually really helpful to know that things are probably fair and square, they deserve it. Because you've got like a very tiny 1.9% um, decrease in the mix from non-interest bearing to interest bearing, okay? And that's a big deal because non-interest bearing is the cheapest capital you could possibly have because you're not giving them, you're basically taking in money from people, you give them nothing, you loan it out, you make a fairly high interest rate at this point. And so their mix remained more or less the same. Now. For PacWest, you can go look at my videos on PacWest and on Western Alliance. That ain't what happened over there. So this is notably better, in my opinion. However, it also means, you know, it's notably better, but boy, would I be stoked if there was another way for you to, like, just have less dependence on deposits. But so far, no one's walking out the door, so they'll be fine. Um, and then they, they do give you the division of, what the nature of the deposits they're paying for is. Okay. Now they offer almost a four and a half percent rate on a CD. So that is a huge amount to offer unless you feel comfortable that you can make loans in excess of that. Right. So it's costing you four and a half percent. You better be getting way more than four and a half percent. Usually 250 basis points would be great, but you got to incorporate any risk that you're also taking in. So let's call it 300 basis points probably in this kind of marketplace. So, you know, whatever that spread is awesome, but we need to feel more comfortable that you're making it. There were a couple places that they tried to show that I think like by next quarter, I'm hoping that they'll be more organized. Um, no, they were very organized. Let me make sure I use the right verbi verbiage. I hope that they have something that will very clearly show to shareholders what the net interest margins are over and above the, the CD that they're offering to just keep assets sticky. Um, other little baby things that I just want to show for people that are looking at this company, the ge geographic mix. OK, the geographic mix does, it, despite the fact that they are based in Arkansas, that is not the geographic mix of either their retail banking or the geographic con uh, concentration of the commercial real estate that they own. So that is in there. If you are betting that this was an Arkansas bank and as a result, Arkansas is not going to do as well as other states, you really should take a closer look at this part of what the bank had to say. And um Otherwise, let me see if I have any little notes. I think that is it. But overall, if it were, you know, I, I, I don't, whereas I see very clearly why people are very negative on Western Alliance and on PacWest because they're worried about the deposits running out the door. They're, you don't quite have the same risk here. You'd really have to have a very strong call on specifically the area of real estate that they're focused on, which I don't have. Um, again, I'll say this because some people were chatting with me because they thought I was very bearish PacWest and Western Alliance in the sense that I thought they were doing something terrible as a bank. All of them are undervalued. Even First Republic was undervalued at the time that it went under. That's why um, JP Morgan can get a billion dollars in gains almost immediately from buying it in, uh, buying the assets in. The challenge isn't that. The challenge is which banks do have this bank run risk because clearly the Fed hasn't demonstrated or the, I'm sorry, the FDIC and related regulators have not demonstrated they can protect these banks. Um, aside from that, I do want to keep doing the banks for a little bit just because um, you know, I've got a, a couple of different types of folks that watch my videos. Some people are legitimately just watching it because they bank with these banks and kind of want to know other friends of mine work in real estate because I'm a Florida kid. And so they just want to know like, Hey, <laughs> what's going on? What are, what are the banks seeing? <laughs> cause I'm, you know, 2008 left a huge imprint on everybody from Florida. Okay. So just quick shout outs, Corey, I have to, um, because I'm in Arizona, I didn't watch it. I enjoyed Cinco de Mayo and the beauty of Sedona, but I will ultimately review the entire, um, the entire thing and do some sort of commentary because a lot of folks don't know this. They do publish the entire day the entire day's commentary on the internet 
Um, so you can absolutely watch it. It is very long, but you know, these two are very thoughtful if for no other reason than they've just been on this earth for a very long time, which I always really respect time and markets as much as anything else. Um, but they're so thoughtful. I, and also the audience that they're speaking to is so significant. I definitely will be listening to that to try to see if there's any in insights to be gleaned, Corey, but just give me a little bit of time because I'm still in Arizona enjoying the sunlight. Um, hello to Pablo AMC, um, CMA, Abs okay, yeah, definitely that's on my list. I might have one more before then, but um, it will it will happen, Corey, for sure. Thank you for letting me know that that's of interest to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I was a huge fan of the Marvel comics back in the day. So Kablam, I believe, was used by Batman and Robin, quoting that. <laughs> um, and then, oh, no, James, you use those. Look, I think they look okay, James, to be fair. Um, it's, it's, you know, you've got some time as far as that goes. So definitely take a look at, you know, if you came in late, um, hopefully my financial review is a little bit helpful there. Um, but I like them as people. They were a fun management team to listen to because, you know, they seem very down to earth in the way that they communicated what was going on. And um, in fairness, all of the banks have been giving crazy amounts of disclosure. So the regional banks, the hate that people have for the big investment banks, I wish they wouldn't carry that into the regionals who are mostly trying to make loans to local businesses. And with that, I'll end it. Thank you guys for watching. Have an awesome week.